top of the morning to you from windy west coast of Ireland. I'm in County Clare and this episode of Live Big is all about flying, as windy as it is. But it might not be what you think. I'm Patrick Sweeney. Welcome to this episode of Live Big. And I'm with Damian Warner. Damien, welcome to the show. Uh, tell us about the falconry program. And well, fal falconry is a, an ancient tradition of using birds of prey for hunting. We have uh, Harris hawks, we have uh, three types of falcons, and we have three types of owl. And what we do here at our falconry is we, we train the birds, um, we fly them, we take people on tours with the birds, educate them about these creatures, uh, let them as as you can see here, get, get close with them a little bit and to uh, spend a bit of time. <laughs> yep. Sorry. Those are, sharp. Those are some sharp claws. Uh, tell us who we have here. This little guy uh, is a dark-breasted barn owl. His name is Pickles. And um, a nocturnal flyer, master of uh, catching rodents. Using his incredible hearing, flat face you see on this bird. It's a parabolic dish. He's using that to collect sound waves. Yeah. This bird can hear a mouse's heartbeat at three to four meters distance. He hears heartbeat at three to four meters, over 10 feet. That's some, that's some real superhero powers. Offset ears allow him to triangulate to the source of the sound. Serrations on the, on the flight feathers allow this bird to fly silently, use that super hearing. So they're really well designed, and I know some of the peregrines, uh, actually the design of jet engines come from a peregrine, isn't that true? Yeah, the, uh, there's a complex baffling system in the bird's nostril. It slows down the air and allows this bird to intake at speeds of uh, over 240 miles an hour. The peregrine flies at 240 miles an hour. Yeah, the fastest, fastest creature on the, on the planet. So the falcons are, uh, are hunting other avian species, other birds in flight, and they get above, above their prey. It could be 1,000, even 15, 1,800 feet above their prey. Wow. They tuck in their long wing structure, create this aerodynamic teardrop shape, and they drop out of the sky like a missile in a, in a diving attack we call the stoop. It's in that stoop where those peregrines uh, reach those incredible speeds, you know, accelerate zero to 200 in two seconds. Now that's bad news if you happen to be a carrier pigeon, right? <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. So our ancestors used these birds to catch small prey, um, food for the table and, and fur for clothing. There's still places where people survive with their birds and, and, and hunt with them. Places like Mongolia, they fly large golden eagles. So today we're going to take out Derby. She's uh, one of our young female Harris hawks. So she's about a year and a half old. When you take a bird out, what do you do? Well, you would, um, you'd have your falconer's bag with food rewards and, you know, today we'll just take her out and we'll, and we'll fly around and see if she sees anything she, she wants to go chase or she wants to hunt. Um, and if not, we'll just get her some exercise and we'll fly her to the glove and, and uh, get her out there. You see here the talon. That's uh, really the business end of any, any hawk. That's what they catch and kill their prey with. Uh, latch on with a great amount of force. There's a ratcheting up the back of the leg in the tendon. So there's a tendon that closes this hand with a ratcheting mechanism. And there's an involuntary cramping response in the leg muscles. It's what we call a digital locking response. So when this bird, when the adrenaline kicks in and they grab a kill, that talon cinches down. They find the head, the chest, um, the neck, and they squeeze on and they physically can't let go. Uh, certain fish eating types of raptors, when they're young, if they take too large of a, of a fish, they can be, literally be pulled under the water and drown yeah. before they're able to let go. You're keeping track of their weight every day. Every day. Very That's sophisticated technical system to do that. <laughs> One of the falconer's most important tools here, the weighing scale. Um, all these birds are like an athlete, they have a flying weight. Uh, which they're going to perform, which they're going to be responsive, which they're going to want to hunt and to fly. So we weigh the birds for several reasons, to, to see where they are in relation to their, their, their ideal flying weights. Um, we know how much to feed them that way. And also, um, general health indication. If your bird starts losing weight rapidly, that's a, a cause for concern. You have to find out why. So, you know, first stop in the morning, we get all the birds out of the aviaries. Um, they step up here onto our state-of-the-art weighing scale <laughs> and uh... Well, there's a 500 year old castle behind us so <laughs> this probably is considered state-of-the-art. And so a simple counterbalance um, this bird is weighing in now at two pounds one and a quarter ounce. 
which is um, a good flying weight for this bird this time of year. Now, I, I, I've never heard of owls uh, hunting, so are these just around here to, to uh, kind of look right. good and hang out and yeah, get all, people's hair? Our, our, our owls, uh, yeah, we use them for education purposes and for display. Uh, I've been falconing a couple years full-time. And owling just occasionally? And just, just occasionally. <laughs> How much space do you need and, you know, that type of stuff? Um, well, you need some equipment, uh, you need some training, but it's not a vast amount of space, you know. Some people keep these in a, in a, in a, in a small room yeah. or um, some people in a, in a car garage or something. Um, you need equipment. The birds themselves, the Harris Hawk is uh, one of the easier birds to breed in falconry, and they're quite common uh, due to their mild, their mild disposition and their their um, very social and intelligent raptors. So they're a very good choice for a first uh, first bird for a falconer. Um, they're chatty. <laughs> they are. Yeah, they're squawking away over there. I think you know, for a few hundred euros, you could you could get a get a Harris Hawk. I assume as things go up into like peregrines and and you know some of the hybrids. I guess you were talking about earlier. Um, those start to get more pricey. It definitely and and falconry's be a bit like horses or something. I mean, you know, you can go get a bird for a couple or a few hundred, or you know, I think one sold for. Three quarters of a million pounds sterling in Good God. In, really? in, in the in the Middle East somewhere a few years ago. That was the record. I, I wow. it was something around that. I think wow. it was three quarters of a million pounds sterling. Holy cow! And a lot of falconers still would do wild take. So um, so my employer got his wild take permit, and and he climbed a, a cliff face and and took a took a wild peregrine a number of years ago and trained it from Ireland. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Ireland gives out I believe six permits a year. And he got one of them. And yeah, it's a lottery system, and he got one of them wow. a number of years ago. And um. You know, traditionally, that's what a lot of people—that's what people would have done. It's um, and different ways which people hunt with the birds. Everything from just putting a bird in a tree and, and going through the bushes, trying to scare out stuff yourself, to people using pointing dogs. Oh wow! Some people uh, in this part of the world use ferrets, which go down into rabbit rabbit warrens and chase the the rabbits up. When the rabbits come up, the the hawks are waiting. You're kidding me? No, no. Uh, that's like a whole team of that's like Doctor Doolittle going hunting. It, exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah. multiple yeah, species working people. together. Wow. People hunting off horseback, and so there's there's all different ways people use these birds. And yeah. <laughs> so didn't the didn't the British use peregrines uh, in the war? In the Second War, yeah, there was a top secret um, falcon program headed by a, a famous falconer by the name of Sir Ronald Stevens. He actually retired here to Ireland, to the west coast of Ireland. And, um, yeah, he, he trained and flew falcons in the event of um, a Nazi, the Nazi, planned Nazi invasion of England. Involved, uh, involved messaging pigeons. And um, also German U-boats sometimes use them. So there, there's some, there's some uh, debate as to how effective that, pro, that falconry program was in the Second World War, but it definitely existed. And, well, it uh, sounds badass. It, it definitely <laughs> does. <laughs> Colonel, what are you in charge of? I'm in charge of the falcons. <laughs> So uh, sometime over the next six months, we'll put this bird to molt, and she'll come back with her ad adult feathers. Uh, the Harris what's, Hawk is, what's it mean to put her to molt? Uh, we induce the molt by upping their weights rapidly, giving them a lot of high-density foods, and uh, it triggers this molting process. So in the wild, the process happens slowly over the course of a year. Uh, they don't lose too many feathers, so they can retain their flight efficiency. Um, but in captivity, we can trigger that molt, get the process done in 8 to 12 weeks as opposed to happening over the course of a whole year. So this species of hawk, the Harris hawk, is uh, native to the Americas. We'd have them in the states in the American Southwest, along the border regions, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, Southern California, Nevada, Arizona. Uh, they range down through Mexico and into parts of South America. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Live Big. It was awesome here in County Clare in Ireland learning all about falconry. I'm Patrick Sweeney. I'm Damien Wernick. Until next time, live, live big. big.